All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Suzanne Grossman. I direct career services at the Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College. I'm with my colleague, Samantha Bruno, who's our interim assistant director. And um, this is a CUNY wide event. Feel free to put in the chat which uh, school you're um, zooming in from. And I am going to welcome Phil Terry, our guest speaker. And before I turn it over to Phil, I will um, give you a little bit of information about Phil's impressive background. Um, so Phil is the founder and CEO of Collaborative Gain. That is a community of senior level digital leaders from corporate and nonprofit sectors who are passionate about helping each other build great products, companies, and careers. Launched with Amazon and Google in 2002, Collaborative Gain's members include other companies like HubSpot, Microsoft, Adobe, and more. Um, as an in-demand advisor and coach, Phil started their career at one of the first companies Amazon bought back in the 90s, and then was the 15-year 15 15-year 15 CEO of pioneering firm Creative Good, running 400 customer experience and product management engagements with Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and others. A graduate of, graduate of the Harvard Business School, Phil also wrote the widely acclaimed Customers Included, an article for the Harvard Business Review, and has contributed chapters to other books. They also founded several nonprofit organizations, um, including Slow Art Day, featured in thousands of museums around the world. With Never Search Alone, now released, Phil has also launched a volunteer movement to build a global community that will be a heart and home for any and all who lose or leave their jobs, which Phil is going to tell us more about. I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Phil. Phil, thanks again for being here. Thank you, Suzanne. It's great to be here to you and Samantha and Elise. Um, really wonderful to be here. I'd like to start with um, an interactive exercise and, and I don't know if it's okay to ask people, we're a small group, if, if you're comfortable uh, turning your camera on, please do, if not, that's fine. But it'd be fun to interact a little bit more that way if you're open to it. Um, but I want before we get into the talk, I wanna start with an interactive exercise that I've taken from a 19th century mathematician named Carl Gustav Jacobi. Uh, Jacobi did a lot of things in linear algebra, et cetera, but he also had this basic rule of thumb which is something I think you all will find valuable throughout your career. Uh, and it's the idea of, of invert, always invert. To really understand a challenge or a problem, it's good, according to Jacoby, to turn it upside down. So these, I like to do these uh, inversion exercises. And so we're here today to talk about, you know, building careers and finding good jobs. But what if we turn that upside down and said, hey, instead we were aiming to like, how could you make sure that um, you know your career didn't go well, or you couldn't find a good job, or that you know you found uh, you know you only you, you positioned yourself so that you got you know something that you really didn't want, um, and that you were really unhappy and disappointed. So if that were our goal, instead of finding a good job, we want to find a bad job. <laughs> what would you what would you do? How would you be sure to find a bad job? And um, you can either shout that out or put it in chat, whatever you like just to have a little fun with this, see if we can learn something about finding a bad job before we talk about finding a good one. If you wanted to ensure you found a bad job, what would you do? Any thoughts on that? Know what you like so you can do the opposite. That's a, that's a, great, that's a great piece of wisdom, exactly. Ignore the qualifications, I like that. Write a poor resume, yeah. Don't ask Suzanne, Elise, or Samantha for help on that. <laughs> what, what else? <laughs> yeah. Don't research enough. Ooh, that's a really, really good one. We're gonna talk about that. Yeah, don't, don't research. Know nothing about the company you're going to. Any other thoughts? And you can say more than one if you like. And you know we're a small group, so I'll I'll bring this to an end in a moment. But um, and again, you can feel free to unmute yourself and shout it out if you prefer. Okay. All right. Well, we have some really good ideas here. Write a poor resume. Ignore the qualifications. Not know what you want to do. 
this is this is this is a big one and it's it's actually and i find with students this it, it's often hard to know what you want actually it takes effort to figure that out and i find a lot of people just skip it <laughs> you know <laughs> and it, it can really lead to bad outcomes um write a poor resume etc don't research enough great all right so we have a good roadmap for how to find a bad job let's see if we can figure out some things about how to find a good one um i'm going to now share my screen i'm going to uh, just share a few slides as we go through this um so i've just published my new book never search alone that's what we're talking about today um and really happy to be here at the mark school of public and international affairs I assume I see the E after the Marx there. So I guess it's not named after Karl Marx. Is that right? No. <laughs> right. right. Uh, my agenda is three part. Uh, Never search alone the book. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book. Never search alone the community. We're building a volunteer driven community with a heart and a home for all of those laid off, let go or otherwise looking. So I want to tell you about that community because and I want to encourage you to be a part of it. It's completely free. Um, and a lot of volunteers, senior leaders are volunteering to help. Uh, and you can also volunteer yourself. So we'll talk about that. And then there's three words, uh, just a piece of advice for all of you. You know, as you, as you develop your careers, you're going to start to do public speaking, either inside government, nonprofit, or whatever organizations you're a part of. And one of the, one of the most important things to learn about public speaking is that most people will forget most of what you say. <laughs> so the, people can only remember a few things. So I'm going to end the talk with three words I hope you remember. Just, you know, can boil it down to three words. Um, but let's, let's go ahead and get started. I want to begin uh, with this photo of my mom. Uh, her nickname was Chick to her friends and family. This is her in high school in 1956. And uh, she started the first council, which you're going to hear me talking about in 1960 and taught me about the importance of asking for help. And uh, she died 10 years ago, uh, just about this month, and I dedicated the book to her. Um, and you'll hear me reference her. So I wanted to let you know. Most of what I write about in this book, I did not make up myself. I learned from other people, starting with my mom, but also with literally thousands and thousands of others who helped me learn what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, my first book, Suzanne mentioned, was called Customers Included. That came out just over a decade ago. I took the philosophy of that first book, which is around customer experience and understanding unmet needs and how to revamp an experience, a journey, a process. And I applied it to the job search, um, which led to 10 years of work, 400 drafts, and literally thousands of job seekers. I had hundreds and hundreds of people actually using early drafts of the book, generating 2,500 comments and driving 400 major and minor drafts till I finally figured this out and kind of got it to a point where it seemed to be helpful to people. And um, that's, a, that's a good lesson. Just, you know, again, when you're in your careers, it's not important that you be the smartest person in the room. It's important that you learn and ask for help. Uh, which, by the way, those are the three words that I'm hoping you learn today, if nothing else. Um, there are three big ideas of Never Search Alone. Uh, the first is Never Search Alone. Instead, create what I call a job search council or a mutual support group of fellow job seekers. And I'll say more about that. The second is candidate market fit. This, this is a little jargony. It's pulled from a piece of jargon in the business world called product market fit, which you may not have heard, I don't know. And it's a twist on that, I'll talk about that. And then what I call four legs to the negotiation stool. So those are the three big ideas of the book. There's a lot of, there's more than a hundred stories. There's more than 15 tools and templates. But if you boil it down, these are the three big ideas that carry most of the weight. Never search alone, candidate market fit and four legs in the negotiation stool. So let me jump into these. And by the way, if you have questions while I'm talking, um, I will be checking chat from time to time. So um, you feel free to ask while I'm talking and I'll try to respond to you in, in, uh, in a real time way. All right, so the first uh, big idea is this idea of never searching alone, instead form what I'm calling a job search council. And here's a slide. So on book launch day a month ago in September, 
I brought together nine people of the hundreds who had used early versions of the book. Each of these people had formed their own job search councils with fellow job seekers. And they came to talk about it. Now I wanna share with you like, KC is at a company called Style Seat um, and had an amazing experience, you know, figuring out her job there. Tanisa Williams just took a job as head of HR for The Economist in the Americas. Victor Cho was the CEO of Evite. You remember that invitation platform? Maybe you still use it today. They're revamping it. And Aaron Cooper was the CEO of Groupon. They had a CEO support group. Every level we've had students in job seeker councils to CEOs and every level and every kind of organization. And they came together to just talk about the experience. And, and here's one of the most important findings of, of the last 10 years of research I was doing on the job search. This is counterintuitive. And people often ask me, what's the most counterintuitive finding that you, and it's very easy, it's this. No matter who you are, no matter whether you're a CEO who ran a public company, um, you know, like Groupon, or you're a college student looking for your first job or a graduate student in a job but looking for a promotion or possibly a move to a new organization, or a mid-career executive who's a VP or an SVP at a bank, or a nonprofit like AARP or any number of uh, NGOs or governmental organizations. One of the people who used my book is now the CEO of the World Wildlife Fund, Lauren Mayer, and you know, you'll see uh, a little bit about her in the book if you pick it up. No matter who you are, no matter how qualified you are, no matter which school you went to, by the way, whether it's Harvard Business School, the most insecure group of people I've ever been with were my fellow Harvard Business School classmates. Okay, no joke. No matter which school you went to, no matter how qualified you are in your career, when you are looking for your next job or a promotion, you are anxious and insecure. This, you know, and people often don't believe me about this. Um, and that's why I did this session on the launch day of the con, because these people generously, Andy had been the head of product at Target. He architected a lot of the features that made Target work so well during the pandemic, like drive up to the store, pop open your trunk and someone brings out the groceries, these omni-channel uh, features. He's now at JP Morgan Chase. Um, he came on and talked about, you know, the challenge he faced, right? KC talked about it, Victor talked about it, Robin talked about it. And literally the thousands of people that I've worked with all feel the same way. So if you're a graduate student and you're feeling like, oh gosh, you know, I'm a graduate student and I'm not like, you know, 30 years into my career. And, you know, so therefore, of course, I'm a little bit anxious. Just know that everyone else feels exactly the same way. Even the CEOs with great resumes and public personas feel that way. So the question becomes, if that's true for everyone, and if insecurity and anxiety leads to lack of confidence and can make it difficult for you to perform well in interviews, to do the research you need to do, to, to not take just the first thing that comes along, you know, as we were talking about in that inversion exercise earlier, then what's the, what's the solution here? Well, I'll tell you what the solution is not. And I wish, I, and I wish this were not the case, but it's not, the solution is not just simply knowing that you're not alone will somehow help. The intellectual knowledge of knowing that, okay, I'm anxious, but everyone else is anxious, doesn't help the anxiety, sadly. I wish it did. Reading my book doesn't help in this regard. My book, I, my book is like a cookbook. You don't get the calories from reading it. You actually have to do something. And the something, the very first thing that I recommend you do is you create a support group, a mutual support group, a job search council. Because if you sit around like these folks on the screen did, and you say, you know, I'm Aaron Cooper, and I'm a little bit anxious and nervous, and you hear from three or four other CEOs like, you know what, so am I. Everyone bringing their anxiety to the group, it flips it. It, it literally, this is one of the great hacks of human psychology. 
literally discovering, like really seeing that we're not alone, not just intellectually knowing, but, but being in the room, whether it's on Zoom or a physical room, uh, together and discovering that you're not alone, converts that insecurity and anxiety that we all feel into hope, motivation, accountability, confidence, and bring some other benefits, which I'll talk about. But th I mean, this is extraordinary. Now, we were not the first people. I was not the first person to discover this. I mean, first of all, my mom started council in 1960. AA began a version of this in the 1930s. The only thing, by the way, Stanford, business, uh, Stanford Medical School, School recently did a, a meta study looking at thousands of studies on alcoholism. And the result was AA is, is the by far the most effective solution for people dealing with um, alcohol abuse syndrome. And, you know, YPO works with CEOs. There's a whole bunch of organizations nowadays who bring people together um, in small support groups and discover the power of doing so. I just said, let's do it in the job search. And by the way, I wasn't the first one to do it there either. Suzanne Grossman, your leader here, was doing it before I was doing it. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't, I, this is, I've just put this together and trying to make it possible for more people to do this. It really works. And if you're interested in learning more or even participating in a job search council, this volunteer community I have, you can actually sign up to join a job search council. It's free. We'll connect you with other graduate students, uh, put you together with them. We'll give you support and training. All of this is free and it's free because we want to create this community with a heart and home because it is just so hard uh, to look for a job. Again, no matter how smart or qualified you are, no matter your credentials, everyone feels this. All right, so this is the first big idea in the book, you know, never search alone. And I hope that 20 years from now, we've had a cultural impact so that no one searches alone. So that this is just, of course, this is the way it works. All right. Any questions on that before I continue? I'm just checking chat here. Ah, yeah, Samantha Bruno led a group for Marx over the summer. Yeah, like you're doing it already. Fantastic, love it. Um, so I'll just pause for a moment. Any, any questions on this Job Search Council concept? Obviously, I've just barely touched on it. We can talk about this more. I'm happy to do Q&A at the end as well. Why don't I move on to the next the second big idea in the book. It's called Candidate Market Fit. This, this is a play on a business piece of jargon, you know, and I'm not a big lover of jargon, but this works so well, I, I grabbed it. So there's something in the business world called product market fit. Has this, ha, anyone heard of this concept before in this group? I don't know if this is, you know, again, I know that you're mostly focused on, you know, the nonprofit government, you know, public policy, that kind of thing, international affairs. So this may not have hit your radar, but in the internet world, product market fit, all, all it means basically is that you've created a product where there's a customer need, where there's a real unmet need and there's a, a problem and you're solving that problem for customers, right? And, um, and so companies work hard to understand their, that was what my first book was about, customers included, helping companies understand their customers and how to build products and services that their customers both really wanted and would help them do, do things in their lives better. So just like product market fit drives business success, candidate market fit drives career success. Candidate market fit drives career success. I just have a couple of examples of product market fit or ones that didn't work. You may be too young, but in the 1980s, Coke totally reformulated its, um, its syrup and so on and released new Coke and it was a huge bomb. Customers didn't want it at all. They loved the old Coke. Um, and you may not know, but there was a company called Bourbon, B-U-R-B-N, that was an internet company that was doing like, you would go to a cafe and you would check in like Foursquare used to do. Again, I don't know if these, if you even remember Foursquare, but Bourbon figured out that it did not have a product market fit, that customers didn't really want to check into some app on like in a cafe, it just didn't matter to them. But they did figure out that customers liked sharing photos and they pivoted and discovered an amazing product market fit. Bourbon became a program, an app that most of you, at least most of your generation uses, it became Instagram, 
but they had a terrible market fit. Who here, anybody here ever heard, hear of bourbon before it became Instagram? <laughs> no. So let me now give you an example of candidate market fit. And I'm happy to say that I can give you an example right from within the CUNY system, actually. Uh, Heather O'Neill, who is an adjunct professor at Hunter College, um, and she's a poet. She was also uh, the first, she and her first wife were the first same-sex couple featured in Modern Bride magazine. It was a whole wonderful affair until they eventually decided, sadly, to get divorced. And they both lived in New York. They had two children. In fact, this is, this is a drawing from one of their kids that you see here, Mommy, Mommy, and Me. And um, Heather had a problem. So she was a poet and an adjunct professor at Hunter College. Uh, and she had joint custody of her kids, but it was going to be very hard to stay in New York, given the cost of living here. So she came to me about a decade ago and said, hey, I don't know what to do because I'm not making enough money to stay in New York, but I have to stay in New York because this is where my kids are. And so I said to her, well, um, let's do this process, you know, so uh, I encouraged her to set up a job search council and then go out and do a listening tour to do some research to figure out what I'm calling her candidate market fit. And I will just tell you that Heather's reaction initially to my proposal is very similar to what most people uh, said as I was writing the book and, and even most readers, it's like, wait a minute, why do I have to do all that? Can I just get my resume out there? Um, and people want to skip this part of both getting the support they need, but also taking a moment, not a long time, but taking a moment to think about what you want. Going back to our earlier inversion exercise, someone said, you know, don't think about what you want. Think about what you want and what the market wants. And the, there's a market in every case. I'm not just talking about for-profit markets, you know, for jobs, but you, you're in the job market, whether you're going into a government organization or an NGO, a nonprofit, community organization, educational organization, whatever it might be. So you have to figure out kind of the overlap between what you want and what the market wants. You know, and Heather's like, I'm an accomplished poet. You know, I'm a teacher, a professor. Why do I need to do this? I'm like, you need to ask for help. I don't need to ask for Why do I need to ask for help? <laughs> but she, uh, she trusted me enough that she agreed to do it. So she formed a support group and she went out there and started talking. And, and I, one of the things in the book that I talk about, I, I lay out this whole process for what I call the listening tour to do your research, to figure out your candidate market fit. And I advise something I call the golden question, which is simply to say, hey, if you were in my shoes, how would you approach this job search? So I said, go out and ask the golden question. Hey, you know, if you were in my shoes, you know, I'm, I'm, she was talking to people she knew for the most part, you know, I'm a poet, I'm a writer, an editor, you know, a teacher, and, but I need to find a way to make more money. I have no idea, you know, how would you think about this if you were in my shoes? It's a really creative way to have the conversation. It's kind of a twist on the informational interview, but it puts them on your side of the table with you and literally in your shoes. And it tends to open up a really good conversation. And she started hearing early on something she had never heard before and she would never had pursued if she had thrown her resume out there. People were saying there's this thing called long form copywriting. You all might not be aware of it. I wasn't aware of it either, but, but organizations like the UN or nonprofits like the World Wildlife Fund or for-profits companies, whatever, will hire people to like write annual reports for them, stuff like that, long form, or even, you know, longer, like write a book for them, that kind of thing. Um, and she's like, really? And finally, one of her students said, because she asked one of her students for help, and they said, well, they said long form copywriting again. And she said, would you please tell me what that is? She didn't explain it. She said, and my husband works at an agency that does this. So let me introduce you to him. And it just changed everything for her. Like until that moment, she hadn't realized that there was even that kind of an opportunity and that she was a perfect fit for something that was relatively lucrative that would allow her to stay in New York. And it did, it, it, it changed everything for her. And uh, she now gives talks about this actually, and talks about how she's just asking for help has become a way of life for her. She just, and all the people she asked for help from, 
10 years ago are still helping her today, by the way, and she's helping them. And her whole career's changed. She was able to stay, she remarried, she's built a thriving life. And then it bridged into a whole new career where now she's doing uh, consulting and editing for best-selling books and such. Like she's really, it's just really gone well. So she's a story in the book, but I've seen this happen literally with hundreds of people. It's important to understand both what you want and what the market wants. And I'm saying slow down initially. I'm not saying take years, I'm saying take a few weeks to do some research to better understand both what you want and what the market wants, right? So Heather didn't go into this knowing she wanted long form copywriting. She didn't even know that existed, right? And so this is one of the challenges I've seen with a lot of people, and this, this is often true with students, graduate students included, is you're not totally sure what you want. You're not sure what's out there even, right? That you should even know what you want. And this goes, and by the way, this continues throughout most people's lives, still getting clarity. And the purpose of the listening tour is not only to understand the market and what are the opportunities, but, but to better refine what you want through these conversations. You're listening and you're learning. You know, so I, I, in the book, I ask you to create a two pager, a Manu what I call a Manukin two pager named after a woman who's a, a, who'd been a member of my community and helped me learn how to do this. She's, she's now a professor at, at, at Harvard and just terrific human being. It's a two pager that says what you want and what you don't want. Right. And I have you do that before you do the listening tour. But I make very clear in the book, this is a first draft. Don't worry about getting it exactly right, because you're going to learn better what you want. And sometimes you're going to even change it as you go through and have these conversations. All right. So that's candidate market fit. It may be one of the more unique concepts in the book. It's one of the more difficult and challenging ones for people to adopt, yet it's really powerful, as you saw here in the case with Heather. Let me check chat, to see if there are any questions. Um, I don't see any, so I'm gonna keep going. And again, we can come back to questions at the end. Um, let me now move to the third concept. Um, there are what I call four legs to the negotiation stool, four legs. Um, so 15 to 20 years ago, research showed that most women did not negotiate comp when they were negotiating an offer. Men did more so, not all, but men did more so. And there's even a famous book that I still like today called Women Don't Ask. I'm happy to report that today, research shows that more women than ever ask around comp, salary and benefits. But almost nobody negotiates for the other three legs of the stool. What are the other three legs? And, and by the way, this is true for students. Students are gonna have, gra graduate or undergraduate, it's gonna be, you know, you're not gonna have the same amount of uh, budget resources support, the other three legs that someone in a mid-career is gonna have. And I'll share a story with you from a student I worked with recently. But the three other legs are budget, resources, and support. Or think about it this way, what do you need to succeed in that new job? Now, if I'm working with a CEO and they're, you know, and I have some of their stories in the book, you know, they're going to say, you know, they're going to talk about and they're, you know, millions of dollars of this or that, and, you know, this kind of support and blah, 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 decision making authority. That's not going to be relevant to uh, either undergrads or graduate students necessarily, graduate students to some degree more. But what you can negotiate is like training, mentorship, support on the job, kinds of work that you're going to be involved in. Like, what is important to you? What's it going to set you up to succeed in this role? It's not just about money. And in fact, what I've really learned over time, and again, I'm not the only one who, who understands this, is that um, if you do really well on the other three legs, if you set yourself up to succeed and the job goes really well, the money will follow. So I care less about the money initially than about whether you're really uh, going to be set up to succeed. So this student at the University of Virginia wanted to go into the healthcare world. Um, and she decided that she would first work at a healthcare consulting firm and then go uh, and leverage that into, uh, into working at a hospital uh, or other nonprofit. Um, 
And so she decided she didn't uh, want to work. She did her research. She did her listening tour. She figured out the bigger consultancies. I don't know if these names mean much to y'all, but there are these big strategy firms out there like McKinsey and Bain and BCG. She decided that wasn't for her. She wanted a smaller firm that was really focused on healthcare exclusively. And so she interviewed with several and she was looking for a particular culture. But then when she got an offer, she negotiated, she didn't negotiate the comp because the starting salary was going to be the starting salary for, for students. And she didn't negotiate budget because she wasn't going to have much control over that. She didn't even negotiate resources because what she can't command resources initially, but she did negotiate support. And she said, you know, I want to make sure that I'm, you know, really I'm working uh, with teams that are doing this kind of work that are I'm passionate about in healthcare and with folks who are going to really mentor me. I want to have skip level meetings. In other words, my boss's boss, I want to meet with on a regular basis. Like, are you open to this? And of course they loved it because she was asking for all the things she was going to need to do well in the job. And it set her up really well. And within a few weeks of starting, she was presenting to clients and, you know, three months later, looking at a potential promotion because she, you know, she really thought about what she was going to need to succeed. Um, and again, this is going to be different depending on what kind of organization, what kind of role you have. Some of you are very experienced graduate students and you're already in jobs. So this might be about your promotion, you know, and all the same things apply here to a promotion. You should be negotiating all four legs of the negotiation stool, budget, resources, support, as well as comp, and even more so uh, for a promotion or a new job outside the organization that you're with today. All right, so that's those are that's a little bit about my book and the three big ideas in the book. Never search alone, set up a job search council, candidate market fit, spend some time to understand that, and then four legs to the negotiation stool. I'm going to switch now and talk a little bit about the community that we're building. Uh, but again, before we do that, I'll pause again. I, I think there might be some things here in chat. Um, all right. Neville says, this is right on time. I'm in the midst of a career transition. Thought I would be able to do so much quicker. And I'm here as part of my informal listening tour. Awesome, Neville. That's great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I hope you consider joining a job search council. You can do, again, the, these are all free services that we support around the book, this community that we're building. Uh, it can really help you do that listening tour well and figure out that career transition well. Um, uh, ask for it is still a terrific book on salary negotiation, especially for women. Yeah, women don't ask, ask for it. Both are great books. Thank you, Suzanne, for adding that in there. Awesome. And, and by the way, I'm not against asking for more money. I've, you know, in the last couple of years, I've helped people ask for about 15 million more dollars in their, in their jobs. So I think it's great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna now shift and talk a little bit about this community. Um, and Suzanne, did you, I mean, you're, you know so much about this, you, Elise, and Samantha, do you want to, do you want to just jump in and anything you'd like to add or, uh, you know, anything I didn't cover that you think, you know, anything you've learned that you, you want to emphasize? I'll let Elise or Samantha go first, if they want to say something. Go ahead, go ahead, Suzanne. Oh, I was letting you go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll actually jump in. So you, I'll give you both more time. I think, Phil, the, the point that you made about negotiating um, the kind of work that you'll be doing, I think that's super important, especially I've seen this shift in what we consider work-life balance, especially with the onset of the pandemic. And we were talking about potentially a recession coming through um, um, and whatnot. And it's really giving people the opportunity to reframe what they want to do and what they thought they wanted to do at first. So really looking, for, not only looking for work that aligns with your values, or we, we have to kind of go beyond what we think traditionally a job description is. Like, yes, negotiate what yeah. you're going to be doing at your job. Are you, you know, you have your list of the set out job description, you know, when you apply to the job, but we all know the part of the job description that becomes the longest when you're writing out your resume is your other duties as a sign. So <laughs> what, what are those other duties that you want to be assigned? I really like that. That's awesome. Samantha, one of the, I didn't mention this, but 
the key precursor to the negotiating the four legs of the stool is what I call. I tell people look, when you're, and I'm sure you do this. And again, you you guys are experts here. Like I'm I'm new to this world in a way, but um, like you have to be active in the interviews. Like you can't be passive. You have to be active. And in fact, I tell people to write their own job description for the job. You know, don't don't just sit with the one because companies are often terrible at writing job descriptions, right? And and even put in accountabilities and then run it by the hiring manager and say, is this, is this what we're doing? Is this what we're talking about? And if you get agreement, then it helps you if you get an offer, negotiate for those other things. Anyway, what, what were you going to add, Suzanne or Elise? I was going to say, I, I love this idea of, you know, you've worked with CEOs and they're nervous and they're anxious. And I, I think that just sort of underscoring this point that everybody at all stages of their career really needs that help and support. And I, I just always love this idea of, you know, you're calling it a job search council, whatever you want to call it, just um, I called it accountability yeah. partners. And you were referring before, I used to run coaching groups for women job seekers. And and yeah, you, you could just see that um, not being alone in your own head um, with with it all is such a such a huge help in propelling people forward. So thanks for, for bringing that idea um, forward today. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I just have to concur. I don't know if I have anything new to add, but for sure, um, I'm a firm believer in not doing anything in your life alone. That's so important to get support and feedback and input from, from all kinds of people. Um, so I really obviously support this, um, you know, uh, activity. And um, I've also, I launched a, um, a workshop uh, developing your interview skills with improv, just that, which I've, I've done a couple of times at the, you know, actually with Marks and then at the Weissman School where I am. And it's just to, um, again, continue, like you're saying that to be an active performer in that process and not just someone who's rehearsed questions that they're gonna regurgitate when, you know, when they're asked that question. Yeah. Um, so well, these are just funny. all, yeah. That's no, go ahead. I love that, Elise. Are you are you can are you doing more of those for the students? I would. Yeah, I'm I'm planning one in early December again for Weissman and um, and open for sure doing another one for Marks if, if they would like. Yeah, well, I would strongly encourage everybody to sign up for that. <laughs> I love that. Cool. All right. Um, well, let's let's keep rolling. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I can't say enough about, you know, to the students here, like you have these amazing resources and Suzanne, Samantha and Elise, I hope you take full advantage and ask for help and really <laughs> apply their, their great uh, insights. All right. So let, let me just say a few words about this community uh, that I'm building and see if you want to get involved in some way. So we have a team of volunteers, phil.org, you know, phyl.org has all this information, but we have a team of volunteers. We'll place you on a job search council. Like, you know, and again, if, you know, and it sounds like Mark's is gonna set up or has done some of this for you already. I don't mean to get in the way, like you're welcome to, you know, do this with us or, or with, you know, even better with your school, but do something. Uh, and we, we provide free training and support we have free tools and templates that have been tested by job seekers and are constantly being improved. We have a whole team focused on that. All of these are volunteers. We have a bi-weekly open house on LinkedIn that brings a couple hundred people together. Uh, and we share stories and case studies. I bring in job seekers. Two weeks ago, I was really moving a senior executive from Silicon Valley. She's very experienced, very, very good at what she's doing, uh, has had a great career. She uh, took a year off uh, to, to spend some time with her family and came back in a year later. She's getting a lot of interest. Um, and I think she's gonna get an offer this week, but two weeks ago, one of the big tech companies made her a verbal offer. They negotiated that offer um, and she was ready to accept when they called her and withdrew it. And I mean, you can imagine how devastating that was and she immediately slacked. I don't know if you know the Slack tool. It's just a, you know, a messaging tool. She immediately got in touch with her counsel and the love and support that poured out within moments, like 
you know, just really change things for her. She, she had done that alone. She would have, she would have really crashed and it would have made it very hard for her to do the interview she had to do the next week, which have led to offers that are not being withdrawn. And this is one of the things that's happening, especially in the internet world. I'm happy to say that it's, I think, less in your world at the moment. There's been more laughs in the tech world, but author, offers are being withdrawn because companies suddenly realize they have to hire, all, freeze all hiring or this kind of thing. And that's just like devastating. And if you're doing it by yourself, she came on and she openly shared this in this open house. It was so moving and giving and everyone was just blown away like by her willingness to be so vulnerable and talk about, you know, one of the things about the job search is that it's like, we all keep it private. Like, you know, even, you know, like nobody talks about what they're going through in uh, at least at a society wide level. It's been very privatized. And we're trying to we're trying to change that. And we have a group on LinkedIn, you know, that's ongoing support. So if, if you're interested, you can either, you know, you can certainly participate, you know, partake of any of these free services and tools. And you can, and, you know, this won't necessarily be of interest to any of you, but just so you know, we're always looking for more volunteers to help us build this heart and a home for all those laid off or let go. It's practical, non-glamorous work, I would <laughs> emphasize, with nevertheless, I think, a big impact. If you're interested, you can email me. Well, if you have a question, you can email me. That's fine as well, just about your own job search or career transition or whatever you're doing. Um, happy to happy to help uh, and point you to anything. And then I will just end the formal part of this talk and go to Q&A if we have any with, again, the three words this is the only thing you have to remember from today's talk are these three words, ask for help, ask for help. Um, it, it is literally, if you remember that and you practice that well throughout your career, it will, it will change everything for you the way it did for Heather, who's still practicing it today. And, you know, it just keeps transforming things for her in every aspect of her life. So Suzanne, Samantha, Elise, I really appreciate you bringing me in today. I'm thrilled to be here and um, I'm happy to, to, to stop now and have more conversation if, if there's uh, interest in questions, comments. Thanks so much, Phil. I put your uh, phil.org link in the chat and um, I have a question when you, when you click on things, it's, it's asking for your email, like the, for the LinkedIn group. So what happens when you hand over your email, do you get an email back eventually saying like, here's how to join the LinkedIn yeah. and all these other things? Yeah, and you don't get marketed to, but we will give you support and help. Yeah. Great. There's real people there. Yeah, behind the scenes. Excellent. Yeah. So any questions for Phil about anything that he talked about? Um, open the chat again. Okay, yeah, that's there. And if and I'm going to stop sharing so we can mm -hmm. see each other better. I was I was going to ask a question of everybody, maybe um, if that's OK. I was wondering what people's um, hesitancy might be in joining a group. Like I know there's, you know, different things might come up or people. So I was just wondering if anybody here has um, thoughts about what mm -hmm. some of your you know, hesitancies might be. Or or not. Or not. <laughs> Christina is like, no, I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's okay to have some. Of course. I love that question, at least. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, maybe it's it's not a, maybe it's like something gets in the way, like feeling like you don't have time or you don't know how to get started or those would be my guesses. <laughs> those are some reasons things that get in the way, but. Um... Or feel shy about bringing stuff to, you know, a group of people you don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that's one of the ones I hear a lot, Elise, you know, and it's, it's, it's it, totally understandable, of course. And one of the things I talk about in the book is the power of strangers. It turns out it's easier to talk to strangers about hard things in your life than it is often the people you know the best. Um, and there's a bunch of research that backs that up, but, but I think you, you know, I think you might realize that if you think about it. Also, people sometimes say to me, you know, I'm an introvert, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't think, I, I don't want to do networking. And I say, oh, I hear you. 
So first of all, this is a small support group. It's not networking. It's, it's building relationships. And half, at least half of the people in there are introverts. Introverts like love this because it's not a cocktail party, you know. And by the way, the support group will also help you go out and do those cocktail parties, which, which can be hard to do for many of us, for me included. Like I, I don't like going to cocktail parties where I don't know that many people. I find that hard. Um, I get it. Um, so another, other, other things that people say is they don't have time. They want to just get out there and get their resume. They feel that anxiety, which I totally understand. Um, it's really worth it. Um, but you know, you have to kind of take a leap of faith. Christina, you wrote in the strength of weak ties. Can you jump in and just share? That's an important concept. Can you say a few words about that? Or is she on here? Yeah, Christina, that was Christina Lynch. I don't know if you can go off audio or not. Um, okay. Um, yeah, we miss small interactions with strangers. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of research. There's a, there was a paper that came out in 1972 by a scholar named Mark Granovetter, who basically pointed out that weak ties can be really, really much more powerful than close ties, especially in things like job searches. And LinkedIn actually just did a multi-year study that, that proved that yet again, that weak ties, that people you don't know or don't know well, acquaintances or strangers, can be some of the most important people in your search. That was that, that concept. Yeah. How, how is, how is your, what you're doing, how does it set up the groups? Like if you're like, I want to be in one of these groups, like how does that, is it, yeah. how are you doing it? Yeah. How does that work? Great question, Suzanne. Thanks. So there's a Google form that people fill out. I can put this in the chat. It's also available on phil.org. So you don't have to remember this long Google form URL, but it, it asks you a series of questions, you know, are you working? Are you a student? Are you out of work? And, you know, and what, you know, what level, if you're not working today, was your last job or what level is your current job? And what are you looking for? This kind of thing. And then we have a team of real people behind the scenes who take that data and find matches. You know, we also ask, are you willing to be a volunteer moderator? Because each of these groups are moderated by a single member and we have additional training like tonight i'm doing a zoom training for all of the job search council moderators who've signed up in the last couple of weeks and then the, we, we actually provide the first 10 agendas you don't have to follow these things but we try to make it totally paint by numbers if you will uh, agendas and exercises and so on and we have found that moderating these groups is really doable because everyone's eager eager to help each other and eager to find a job. Um, and so it's not as hard a job, let's say, as moderating a group. What we do, my day job is I run councils for people in jobs that are helping each other grow their companies and careers. Uh, those that takes a little more effort and training. But we have found that that, you know, folk regular job seekers, if they're willing to do it, you know, just need to sort of show up, be on time, be organized and and be willing to be vulnerable yourself to kind of model asking for help and being vulnerable. Um, yeah, does that answer your question, Suzanne? Yeah, it does. And it, I think it's interesting because, you know, there is that concept sometimes um, where people feel like they need to pay in order to have accountability to themselves. Like we pay to go to a gym and like, right. you know, and I, I think you're doing, you're, doing a little bit of a different model of it's volunteer based. And so you have to have that mo internal motivation yeah. to get that support. Yeah. And we also, my team behind the scenes vets everyone who signs up, you really want to do this, you know, like, you know, and the, especially the moderators, but also the members. And they're constantly working with the councils. If someone drops out, if they want another member to join, you know, yeah, it's a, yeah, we could have gone the paid route and decided not to, and we'll see, you know, but it seems to be working. It's interesting. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to chime in. Um, the question was asked earlier about hesitations. And I think for me, I recently went through a similar situation to the example that you gave, where I made it to the final round of an interview, um, was told, you know, <laughs> almost, almost, almost offered a verbal, a verbal offer. And then, you know, was ghosted and that experience of being professionally ghosted for weeks no one got back to me 
Um, and then uh, so eventually um, I did get a response from HR and you could tell it was a copied and paste response because the texts were half the email was in one text and the other half of the email was in <laughs> right. another font. Right. Um, oh. And I, you know, I, I found comfort in my partner and, and my best friend, but I wish I had a, a counsel in that moment yeah. because it did, I, it was a very depressing experience um, because I had planned my entire month for this transition uh, of leaving yeah. one job to transition to another and through wrapping up work and then all these other things. Um, so I, I'm really um, in awe of what you're offering and I think it's, it's a great resource and I, I look forward to participating. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so sorry that, that you went through that. And I'm glad you had your partner and best friend with you, you know, but um, boy, it is, de it is devastating. And, and thank you for sharing that you know, so giving to do that. So everyone else on the call here knows they're not alone, right? Um, er everyone's gonna have an experience like that somewhere along the way. And it just, ah, oh, it feels so personal. And it often has nothing to do with you at all, by the way, right? But but that doesn't matter, it feels that way. Um, it can be so, so thank you, Neville, wow. Thank you. Oh, this is a great question from Fakira. Um, do companies provide a returnship program for moms who are on maternity leave for many years, but now they're ready to pursue their career? So the answer is not enough. Uh, a few, but not many. Um, and there are some organizations out there that specialize in this. And we do have some people signing up for job search councils who are in that same position and we're putting together kind of a mom's group or at least a return after many years group because uh, there's some really specific challenges that's a that's a tough road and you need all the support you can get um, and you know I wish more of the world had these and I hopefully they will have more uh, Suzanne do you want to talk about the link you yeah put so I relaunch is, is the um, one of the big resources on on this topic. They just had their virtual conference. I have a friend who I who had been out has been out of the workforce 10 years who just went to it. Um, but they have so much, I would highly recommend signing up for their emails because more than ever, there are these returnships where it's re in order to get into them, you have to have been out of the workforce. Like I wouldn't be eligible for some of these opportunities, which they tend to be very corporate. Um, so their big corporations are now more and more offering these opportunities where you work for three months full-time um, as a returnship. Um, but yeah, I relaunch is, is a great resource and, and it's, it's similar in terms of like, never, you're not alone. There are many other people in the same situation and, and they're specifically targeting that particular group. I don't know yeah. if they run like, like the same accountability job search councils or not. They, they might, but um, they certainly have a lot of resources. Sounds awesome. I love that. And Jessica, is there an accountability aspect to the council in a kind of semi-formal way? Yes, I, I should have mentioned that. When a new job search council forms, they have a charter and they agree on the charter, which is things like the cadence of meetings, the attendance, confidentiality, and what you're referring to here, real accountability that we're gonna do this together. And I'm gonna be open and vulnerable as, as are all of you, yeah. And it, it it's working, you know. I have to say, it's it's been very interesting the last couple of years as I've been finishing the book and having people I don't know run job, their own job search councils with people I also don't know, seeing if this works. And they've been really supporting each other, been really there for each other. Um, you know, there, there will always be once in a while a job search council that doesn't work out, but for the most part, 99% of these seem to be creating deep levels of trust and accountability. Yeah. Great. So uh, on that note, please join me in thanking Phil in the chat or um, put in your emojis. Hey, okay, thank all of you. Um, we really appreciate you being here. And everyone here has the contact information, the website. Um, there were also a variety of other people who signed up who couldn't make it, who I'm sure will want the content. So I'll be sending them um, yeah. the recording. And um, yeah, thanks again, Phil. Appreciate um, all your words. Absolutely, Suzanne. And I'm uh, happy to come back anytime. I love, 
what you and Samantha and Elise are doing and want to support these students in any way Thank I can. You. Thanks so much for that. All right, take you. care, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.